to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the lord and savior jesus christ said if you love me keep my commandments john chapter 14 verse number 15. we welcome you today to our study of answering denominational doctrine today we're going to consider the various doctrines and teachings of the pentecostal or assembly of god movement and as we look at the doctrines inside this movement and their teachings, we just simply want to open the Bible and see if the two are in harmony. And friend, as we look to this together today, we encourage you to have your Bible handy, locate your Bible, have it handy, as we're going to let the Word of God alone be our guide today. We're so happy that you've tuned in for our study together today, and we want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your local area. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit them. Uh, you can visit one of their assemblies on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday, and I assure you, you would be their honored guest. You will find people at the Lord's Church who love God and the Bible and are just simply concerned about doing what God says and loving one another. Friend, we also want to help you in any way that we can in your study of the Scriptures here at the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a large variety of study resources that are available to you free of charge. All of our DVDs are available online free, as well as audio as well as transcripts and study questions. If you'd like to have a hard copy of today's lesson to study for yourself or to give to a friend or neighbor, friend, just write to us or call us. Send us an email. You can go to our website, fill out a media request form, and we'll be happy to mail that to you free of charge. We'll even pay for the postage. Also, don't forget with the age of technology today to download our apps from both the Android and Apple Store. Those are available free of charge as well and they're great study resources. As we think today about the Pentecostal or Assembly of God movement, we mentioned from the outset that there are many people in this organization who have a fervor an excitement and a passion for God and things of a religious nature. We don't doubt their commitment. We don't malign their uh, desire to serve the Lord at all. We have no ill will or hard feelings toward any of those people. In fact, we have good friends, neighbors who are involved in this movement. And as we think about studying these doctrines, please understand from the outset, we just simply want to see our desire is just simply to examine the official teaching of this movement, compare it with the Bible, and see if it's true to the Word of God. And so as we said, please have your Bible handy as we're going to look together at the doctrines of the Pentecostal or Assembly of God movement. What are some of these doctrines? One of the main doctrines in the Pentecostal or Assembly of God movement is their belief in the baptism of the Holy Spirit being for us today. The position of the Assemblies of God is clearly declared in Article 5 of their Fundamental Statements of Truth. They say this, All believers are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father, the baptism of Holy Spirit and fire According to the commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen now, this was the normal experience of all in the early Christian church. A friend, they'll often mention passages like Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 10 or Joel chapter 2 where give us support 
supposedly alleged support for this idea. But friend, think about this with me. Was it really the normal experience in the New Testament that when somebody was baptized, they were filled with the Holy Ghost? Well, really, we only find two accounts of it. That's Acts chapter 2, the promise of Joel 2.28 was that when God brought forth His salvation, all flesh would see the Holy Spirit, and we know that all flesh would be representative of both Jew and Gentile. The Jews in Acts chapter 2 were baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 were also baptized with the Holy Spirit. But as far as that being a normal experience anytime someone obeyed the gospel, friend, we just don't find that in the New Testament. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, it wasn't the 120 who were there that actually were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 verse 43. Let me mention these verses. Oftentimes it said, well, everybody in Acts chapter 2, the whole 120 who was there received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, friend, that's not what we find even in Acts chapter 2. Look in your Bible in Acts chapter 2 verse number 43. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through who? Through the apostles. We'll look in Acts chapter 1, verse number 13. And when they had entered, they went up into the, into the upper room where they were staying. And it mentions Peter, Jay, all the rest of the disciples. And so when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, it was the disciples who were there. And it was the disciples who had the ability to do the wonders and the signs. And so the idea that the 120 was baptized is just not clearly supported from the scripture. The proper understanding of the word flesh in Joel 2.28, all flesh would be both Jew and Gentile. You've got Jewish people and you've got Gentile people. And in Acts 2 and 10, both of those received the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a sign of ushering both into the kingdom of God. But friend, when you read about, think about this now. You read about the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 8, we don't, nothing is said about him being baptized with the Holy Spirit. We, we read about the Corinthians in Acts 18, 8. We read about people throughout the book of Acts obeying the gospel. And the only two accounts where it's mentioned is Jews in Acts 2, Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. As in accord with God's promise in Luke chapter 24 verses 4 to 4 following, God told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem till you are endowed with power from on high. They waited there, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and thus they fulfilled that promise just as God had told them. But here's a big problem with that. In the statement that is made in Article 5 of the uh, Assembly of God or Pentecostal movement, they say that it is a normal experience for people to receive the baptism of Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire. Now, to understand Matthew 3, verses 11 and 12, we've got to remember that the baptism of the Holy Spirit came to fruition in Acts 2 and 10. And friend, Matthew 3, 12, John affirms, in Matthew 25, verse 31, John affirms as well that the baptism of fire, I'll assure you, is not something you want to receive. The baptism in fire would be the baptism or immersion in the torment of hell. And so that's not something that people want to actively be pursuing or looking for. Then as we think about various doctrines of the Pentecostal church, another major one along with the idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the practice of miracles like we see in the first century. Pentecostalism and the Assemblies of God claim that they have that ability to do the miracles that we see in the first century. The Assemblies of God believe, their statement says from the Assembly of God website, the Assemblies of God believe unequivocally that God still performs miracles today. This conviction grows out of a firm belief that the miracles recorded in the Bible were historical events, not myths or folk stories. There is no indication in Scripture that miracles have ceased or will cease in the present world order. 
Because there are confirmed instances of miracles happening today, we must conclude with certainty that God still performs miracles. Jesus Christ, the greatest worker of miracles, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, verse number 8. And so the idea is that people inside the Pentecostal movement often have a great fervor, and a lot of that involves the, the Holy Spirit and the idea that they can still perform miracles just like they see in the Bible. Well, several passages are mentioned uh, in support of this. Hebrews 13, 8, many Pentecostals will claim Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, we should still be able to do miracles. Well, friend, in the context, they're talking about the person and the character of Jesus, not the miracles that Jesus gave his disciples power uh, to do. Matthew 18, 20, many inside the Pentecostal movement claim that since Jesus is still with us today, we can still do miracles. Well, friend, are people still walking on water? Are, are, are people still raising the dead? Those things are not happening today. And so when we think about the idea of miracles, here's some things that we've got to consider. Does the Bible teach miracles were designed to last forever? It doesn't matter what I think, and it doesn't, in all honesty and kindness, it doesn't matter what you think about it. What matters is, does the Bible still teach that miracles, does the Bible teach miracles were going to last forever? And friend, the answer is a resounding no. Let me show you in your own copy of the Bible. Look in 1 Corinthians 13 with me. And I want you to notice what the Scripture teaches about miracles in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now the context of 1 Corinthians 13 is the miraculous. 1 Corinthians 13, you've got tongue speaking, you've got prophecy, you've got miraculous knowledge all being mentioned. And what does Paul say about that? Notice verses 8 through 10. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, and in the context, that's miraculous knowledge. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. The partial, no doubt, is the prophesying, the uh, miraculous knowledge, the tongue speaking, the miracles. When something perfect or complete comes, the partial is going to be done away with. Well, first we have to ask, what is that perfect? And friend, this word is attached to something else in the Bible that is going to come into completion. James 1.25 says, toward the close of the New Testament, we now have the perfect or complete law of liberty. What was the purpose of miracles? Friend, miracles were designed to confirm the Word of God. According to Mark 16, 17 and Hebrews 2 verses 1 through 4, people could handle deadly snakes, people could do miracles, people could drink poisonous things, and that was a confirmation to those who heard them that they were a servant of God. And so miracles were divine, designed to confirm. They were like a, miracles in the New Testament were like a big, bright, blinking sign pointing to God's spokesman. We've illustrated it this way in the past. If you have two preachers stand up to preach in the first century and both have messages that are different and maybe even uh, diametrically opposed to each other, how are you going to know which one's right? We say, well, I'll get my Bible. Wait a minute now. The Bible's still, be written, still being written. How are you going to know which one's right? You're not going to turn to Acts chapter 2 or Matthew 16 and, and say, well, that man's teaching error. How are you going to know which one's right? Well, this man can handle deadly items. This man can raise the dead. This man just drank poison. He just performed a miracle. We know for sure that's God's sign of approval upon him. And so miracles were designed to confirm the Word. Friend, we now have the confirmed Word of God today, the perfect law of liberty, and we can absolutely know what God's will is. But on top of that as well, the New Testament clearly teaches that miracles were not designed to last forever. Now, friend, I want you to listen real carefully. Are we saying that God is dead? Well, of course not. 
Do we believe in the power of prayer? If any among you is sick, let him pray. Absolutely. We believe God works in His own time, in His own way, in His own power, through the power of prayer, uh, and we realize that. But do men today have the ability to lay their hands on somebody and make someone who has a withered arm make it complete? Do men have the power today to lay their hands on a dead person and make them arise? Can You know, you see this in the news sometimes. Can people handle a rattlesnake today and at night bite them? Can somebody drink cyanide and that not affect them? Well, friend, we're saying those things have ceased. That no longer is in existence because it was designed for a specific purpose and with a limited end inside. It wasn't to last forever. Now, let me illustrate this from an example that I'll use for you today. It's been several years back but I remember there was a uh, Pentecostal group in a town that I lived in had advertised that they were going to have a healing service. And so a, a friend and I just went to see what the healing service was going to be like. They advertised it. They invited the public. And so we went to this healing service. And I remember as we sat and watched, there were several people who allegedly were healed. And I remember one man so vividly. This man came in with an oxygen tube on, he was in a wheelchair, he was real decrepit looking, couldn't hardly get around, and so they, they got his oxygen off of him, and they got him up out of the wheelchair, and everybody gathers around him, and they lay hands on him, and you know, they're all praising God as it were, because he's out of his wheelchair, and he doesn't have his oxygen on anymore. God's healed him evidently. Well, they, in about five minutes, they moved on to somebody else. And as I watched things unfold, it wasn't long until that man had his oxygen mask back on and was back in that wheelchair. And I, I went up and asked one of them afterward who so allegedly got healed. I said, uh, do you feel better? He said, well, maybe a little. I said, do you feel like you're healed? He said, not really. And I thought to myself, you know, they've, they've promoted this idea. They've pushed, you know, that this person's healed and they're not healed. He's still got his oxygen mask on and he's in the wheelchair. Friend, that's, that's not the way it happened in the New Testament. People who had a, a withered hand or people who couldn't walk or people who were lame, they would be the people who would get up and jump and run according to the Bible. And so when you think about the idea of divine healing, we're not discrediting the power of God. We're just simply saying the Bible teaches that power was limited and that power doesn't exist today. Let me ask you this. According to the Bible, how did that power get passed on? I want you to look in your Bible for just a moment in Acts chapter 8. I want you to notice an example from that of Simon the sorcerer. Acts 8.18 8, says this, And when Simon saw, through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. How? Did the people in the first century receive the Holy Spirit and the miraculous? Simon saw through the laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. Well, friend, when the last apostle died, the ability to pass that on ceased with them as well in the first century, just as 1 Corinthians 13 teaches. But here's another thing to consider. Friend, if I have or you have or I claim to have the ability to do miraculous, to do miracles just like in the first century, and I don't do that today, then I am one of the most wicked and evil persons you could ever imagine. And here's what I mean by that. I think about all the little children who are up in St. Jude's Children's Hospital right now. And I think about every room probably up there that's full of little children with diseases and cancer and, and suffering and those innocent little children. And here we've got people who are claiming they have the same power and the same ability that Jesus and the apostles had in the first century. Friend, hear me well today. If you've got that power and you don't go up to St. Jude's and heal children up there, why not? What's wrong with you? What's the holdup? And so we say this just simply to illustrate that that power ceased 
Why are people not... Why are people not doing that? Why are people not going up to St. Jude's and healing children today? And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says that power was limited to the first century. Its purpose was to confirm the word. When the confirmed word was completed, that purpose was accomplished. And with the death of the last apostle, the ability to pass that on cease to exist. And so, so many times people got up, get caught up in the, the emotional aspect and the, you know, we've got the Holy Ghost and we're going to go out and perform all these miracles. Friend, do you realize, according to 1 Corinthians 13, that miracles are not the biggest thing? I don't say that in any disrespect. They're powerful. They were powerful in the first century. We absolutely believe in them. But what is the most powerful gift, according to 1 Corinthians 13? It's not miracles. It's not tongue speaking. It's not miraculous knowledge. You know what the greatest thing you could ever share with somebody is? Love never fails. Going out and teaching somebody about the love of God and the love of Jesus and the hope of Christianity, you couldn't do anything. You could heal their body and it wouldn't be as powerful as teaching them about how to become a Christian and how to be saved. If you heal their body, that body eventually is going to wear down. You teach them about becoming a Christian and save their soul. Friend, that'll last through eternity. And so we think about these ideas as we consider doctrines of the Pentecostal church. Another one that is so very popular and is uh, attached to this idea of the miraculous and the Holy Spirit also deals with speaking in tongues. The assembly of God believed that a manifestation of the Holy Spirit for us today is the ability to speak in some heavenly language that the Spirit inspires within you. They support this doctrine by saying, First, let us examine the Scriptures. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon the assembled believers, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Later, as Peter was preaching at the house of Cornelius, the Holy Spirit came upon all who had heard the message, and they were speaking in tongues and praising God. Again, as the Apostle Paul was ministering to Ephesian disciples, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. It is evident also that Paul himself was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. These scriptures clearly show that speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Our friend, as you think about the idea in the scripture of speaking in tongues, let's consider some of what the Bible teaches on that subject. First, we need to understand that tongue speaking was not some heavenly language that nobody knew. The Bible teaches that tongue speaking in the scripture is the ability to speak in another language that already existed without having studied that language. How do we know that? Well, that's what Acts chapter 2 shares with us. Open your Bible to Acts chapter 2 and I want you to see that tongue speaking is not some heavenly gibberish that nobody's ever heard of or some heavenly language that nobody knows. Tongue speaking in the Bible was the ability of the individual in the first century to speak in a language he'd never studied. I've never studied German. If I were in the first century and were filled with the Holy Ghost and could speak in tongues, I would be fluent in German without ever having studied a word of it. That, that's what we're talking about. Let me show you that from Acts chapter 2. The Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now watch what is said in verse number 8. When the people hear them speak in these other tongues, what do they say? Acts 2 verse 8 tells us what it is. How is it, they said, that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And notice verse number 6. When this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Friend, the miracle was that when God had the, 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 the apostles stand up and preach, the miracle was they had never studied all these various languages, and yet when they spoke, people heard them 
in their own language. It wasn't some heavenly unknown tongue. It was a known language that they had never studied. But here's what we also know about tongue speaking. You know, a lot of time I hear people talk about tongue speaking and, and they, they think it's some, well, just the grandest thing ever. But friend, did you know in the Bible to speak in tongues, for it to be of any value, there had to be someone there who understood that language? Look in your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want to mention a, a couple of other things about tongue speaking. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I want you to notice what the Bible says about there needing to be an interpreter there or it is of no value. The Bible says in beginning in verse number 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you by revelation, knowledge, prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, flute, harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sound, how will it be known or played? And Paul's going to go on here to say, unless there's somebody there to interpret it. Look in verse 13. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is fruitful. What is the conclusion then? I'll pray with the spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding. In this context, Paul's saying, if you don't have an interpreter, you don't need to be speaking in tongues, because that's not going to do anybody any good. And friend, let me mention this also. There's so much of a push about the emotional side and the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit, that the indication is you can't be a child of God unless you can do some miraculous with the Holy Spirit. Can I remind you of this? In Luke 1.15, the Bible says of John the Baptist that he had the Spirit without measure. And yet in John 10.41, the Bible says John never did any miracle. My friend, just stop and think about that. John had the Spirit without measure, Luke 1, 15. John did no miracles, John 10, 41. The implication that you're not a faithful child of God if you can't do the miraculous is just not true in the Bible. And so here's what we ask. Examine the Scriptures as it relates to the Holy Spirit. Check the things we've said. Study them in your own Bible. And if they're true, just simply obey them because God said so. And friend, we want you to know today, as we mention these things, we want you to know that God loves you, that we love you, Check for yourself and see if what we're saying is true to the Word of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.